uh, audio is not working, but uh, welcome all to our third meeting of the SIOP uh, Global Health Young LMIC. And it's nice to see all these 17 people who have joined. And uh, all the last two meetings have been excellent and been appreciated a lot. And we have two superstars with us today, uh, Dr. Scott Howard, who needs no introduction, and my uh, dear colleague, uh, Sanjeeva Gunasekra. As Scott has just messaged that Sanjeeva, please go first. Sanjeeva, you would like to go ahead? Okay, great. So uh, Sanjeeva is a dear colleague. We were in the same cohort in the Masters in Global Child Health at St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Uh, he's a pediatric oncologist from Sri Lanka, doing wonderful work there. Uh, and we know the current circumstances in Sri Lanka. Uh, and despite all the adverse uh, adversities there, uh, they're hanging on and uh, ensuring that uh, children with cancer get the best possible care. And Sanjeev has done a lot of work in the field of access to essential medicines. Some of us, uh, in most countries, it's taken for granted that medicines would be available, but Sanjeeva, uh, especially in smaller LMICs, medicines have to be imported, and it becomes really difficult, and you have shortages, and children are off without uh, chemo for a long time. And uh, Sanjeeva has done really good work in this field, and hopefully uh, his work will act as an agent of change to you know, make the access to essential cancer drugs for children all across the world. Welcome, Sanjeeva. Uh, over to you and your presentation. Thank you, Venkat. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. So, at, as Venkat said, uh, this is something that is very close to my heart and probably has impact across the board in many of the low and middle income countries. So it's, it's, it's an additional pleasure to speak in the company of uh, Dr. Scott Howard here, who had for many years worked a lot in this area and actually has done tremendous amount of work to, um, uh, to, to improve access, especially in the, the LMICs uh, with the collaboration of the WHO. And I have to acknowledge uh, some of the work with which we'll be presenting here is uh, uh, thanks to the support of a wonderful team uh, from Sri Lanka, from St. Jude, special mention has to be made of uh, Dr. Kat Lam uh, and, uh, and support from many, many of you who are uh, maybe even present in this uh, call today. Uh, so when we first talk about access to essential medicines, we need to really see what do we mean by essential medicines. So this is not a term that is um, easily uh, easily covered. Uh, uh, in a sense, is loosely covered by many people all over. But there is something called the WHO model list of essential medicines. Uh, some of you might be aware. So uh, excuse me if I'm just uh, going through some things that you already know. But this WHO model, uh, we really need to have a grasp of what this WHO model uh, model list of essential medicines are. So these are first formulated in 1977, then uh, uh, the new, newer versions comes usually every two years, and the latest version was in 2000, um, uh, 2019, uh, sorry, 2021. And uh, this is basically a list of medicines which help countries prioritize selection of medicines for making sure that it's available in the health system, or if it's uh, in a system where it, the medicine costs are reimbursed for priority, prioritizing for reimbursement. So why does such a list exist? So as we know, with proliferation of medicines, uh, especially in the adult cancer world for various indications, countries are struggling, especially the countries with limited capabilities, which can choose, which can compare the health economic benefits, which can uh, uh, quantify the, the clinical benefits of medicines, are really struggling to choose which drug should be prioritized over the other. So in this instance, the WHO has stepped in and to make it easier, uh, among other things for countries like uh, ours, uh, to choose medicines for ensuring their uh, continuous availability. So there is a essential medicine list for children as well, uh, denoted by E, M, L, and the small c, and it is currently in the eighth edition. 
So what we are interested is mainly the section eight, where they talk about the antineoplastics and immunomodulators. In the latest version, they have identified 41 medicines, which, are, which can come in 102 formulations. So is availability of these essential medicines a problem? If you look at the, the published literature so far, uh, it is, in short, the short answer is yes, it is a problem. Uh, so in this cross-sectional survey, uh, Cohen and some of the, the authors which are quite familiar to you, clearly demonstrated that uh, optimal access to EMLC, EML medicines is a problem all over the world, but especially so in the uh, LMICs, and even in high income countries or the percentage is low, it is still a problem and that need, that is a concern. So there are smaller studies available in, uh, in different parts of the world. These are more localized studies, but they also show that it is a problem and it is usually more of a problem in the public sector hospitals compared to private sector hospitals. Even if the, the not only the medicine availability, some of these medicines even are not even registered for use. So they are not widely available. They are not continuously available. And some of the more, and a significant number, like 27% in Armenia was not even registered for use. So as you can see, availability of essential medicines, especially when it comes to um, uh, anti-cancer medicines and in children, it is a problem all over the world. But if you look at all of these studies, there are two main issues in these. So all of them are cross-sectional studies. So you know the drug availability, essential medicines availability is a, is a quite a dynamic problem. Uh, so some of these medicines which are available this week might not be available the next. So a cross-sectional study is probably not the best way to get a true picture of the uh, of this problem uh, so and even and when you most of these studies have considered just a simple one single formulation of a given drug but in cancer it often doesn't work it might work in things like antibiotics uh, and uh, and maybe cardiac medicines or things like that but not in cancer so forget the example of methotrexate so methotrexate, high-dose methotrexate, where 500 milligram or one gram vials are used, the indications are quite different from ALL maintenance therapy when uh, oral methotrexate of 2.5 milligram uh, tablets are used. So just the black, you know, assessing the availability of the uh, a single drug without considering their individual formulations doesn't actually uh, really serve much purpose. So because of this, so to plug the, the, the gap that is existing already in, in the country, we devised, we started on this project to track the prospective availability of essential medicines for a period of one year. Uh, so we re recently presented this at the, the Lancet Cancer Summit for Asia and South America. And, uh, and we, the, the uh, a neat thing about this is we used a custom made tool uh, using uh, Microsoft Excel. Uh, I don't want to try to demonstrate it just now. I am sure I'm going to run into technical difficulties and because of the, the, the short time we have, I will not demonstrate that. But this is basically, this gives not only the uh, uh, assessment of the availability of these medicines, but it gives a visual picture of the availability as well all these individual green boxes demonstrate a drug being available on the on any given day red means that is not available and yellow it is in short supply or there is a shortage uh, so for using this simple excel sheet you can get various details like how many types of medicines are not available on a given day or for that month, how, how many um, medicines were not available. And out of the total uh, number of medicines of these essential medicine lists, uh, what percentage of medicines are available or in short supply or not available at a given week, month or a day. Um, and so likewise there you can get various summaries without any analysis, just using this uh, uh, Excel sheet. 
So we found this very uh, useful when we had discussions with the, the policymakers, the decision makers of the Ministry of Health, uh, because it's rather than saying that a X plug was not available 25% of the time. If we can open this spreadsheet and do show this in a more um, visual way, we, we uh, see that it has got a lot of impact. So uh, uh, just to share some of the results that we had see, we, we, we saw. Uh, so um, uh, um, so Sri, in Sri Lanka, actually the medicine, medicine registration was quite good. Almost all medicines were uh, uh, registered for use, which were in the essential medicine list, but only 17 medicines were available 100% of the time and 100% of the medicines were not available at in any given day during these 365 days. So the, the, the drugs affected more were procarbazine, binblastin, and cytarabine, and it, 34 individual, um, uh, sorry, 31, all 31 individual medicines had some sort of a uh, stock out or a shortage at some point of time. So when you take all these drugs, the mean stock out period was 54.8 consecutive days. So, so that means that for some drugs on average were not available for nearly two months. Uh, so, but so, uh, so one thing that I need to, you to take note, which we will come back to later, is only three medicines did not have um, uh, alternate formulations of substitutions during these stockouts. The, the, those were namely in Christine, Cytarabine, and 6MP. So we did a um, uh, uh, regime-wise analysis of, as well to, to look at which uh, cancers were mostly affected. Uh, so we what we looked at was mainly the WHO Global Initiative for Children, the six index cancers. And there is there are two ways of looking at this. We can either assess the number of stockout episodes they had or the median stockout uh, period. I think uh, the episodes are what, what is more informative. And if you look at that, the Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, was the most uh, impacted, uh, uh, affected cancer out of the six cancers. So then we wanted to quick analysis of the possible causes. So when we started this project, we thought we were always thinking of the, you know, the, uh, the usual suspect, the, the annual consumption, how if, the, if a drug is being consumed more and more, the chance of that being in stock out is more, or the unit cost, the more expensive a drug is, again, higher chance of that drug not being available. Uh, are the annual cost, which is basically a product of annual consumption uh, into the unit cost. But surprisingly, there was no significant association was seen uh, with any of these issues. So this shows that uh, the, uh, the availability of medicines is not as simple as we would think, and we can't attribute it to the, the, the usual suspect that we can think of. Uh, so because of that, now we are launching, uh, we are planning our phase two of this project. So here, what we really wanted to see, what is the actual impact of non-availability of these medicines? So it's all good to say that procarbazine was not available 54% of the time. But if it to be, uh, if we are to make a compelling case to improve accessibility, we need more, uh, uh, more data on what's the actual impact on the patients. Uh, do they have to incur increased out-of-pocket expenses or do they have treatment delays or even worse, mistreatment? So quantifying that, I think it is very important to, uh, to make a case uh, before when we are trying to improve accessibility. So there is impact on the wider health system as well. So simply because of this non-availability of medicines, there can be increased abandonment. Or even the, the providers, even the doctors sometimes are forced to use non-standard substitutions, uh, which, uh, which, which, which is not ideal and which, is, uh, uh, which takes away the, from the whole concept of standard regime use in a country. Uh, so that's those are the areas that we would want to uh, to uh, to explore further, together with possible uh, reasons for stock out, stock out. So from what the data we had, as you saw, 
we it is there is no one single reason we can attribute to a stock out so this we need wider deeper uh, uh, exploration of these reasons and um, and uh, and from the preliminary uh, um, data we have gathered uh, i can just mention that it is it is not just one factor causing that but a, a collection a constellation of factors um, causing this so uh, i i'd like to uh, spend my next uh, i think uh, next 7 minutes uh, just discuss throwing some points for discussion these might be provocative and uh, these are not you know absolute things that i'm talking about this is open for discussion uh, from all of us and um, and and be very interested in your thoughts so as you know the essential medicine list has grown substantially and it is continuous continuing to be uh, um, it, it continues to grow and and now it has grown for about 45 uh, individual drugs and over 100 formulations so even a single addition of a drug makes it more complicated to ensure availability in the national setting so Yes, we know that national essential medicine lists are supposed to be modeled on the WHO list. There is nothing to say that the WHO list should be copied in its, in its entirety as a national essential medicine list. But what the, the main reason the WHO started having a list like this, because the countries like ours uh, is not capable or does not have the technical expertise to choose between drugs. So when we are again asked to choose from another list, it is not as simple as um, uh, getting an entire list down. So probably, uh, and, and you know the recent uh, um, uh, uh, recent studies published in this area shows that most of the oncology these are again surveys uh, of oncologists. So most of the oncologists things that the the whatever the medicines they want are already in the essential medicine list. And, but it all, again, the same survey shows the availability, even when they are, although the list are in the WHO essential medicine list, the availability, on the ground availability in the individual countries it has far from improved quite a lot. So the problem is not, I don't think the problem is expanding the essential medicine list continuously. So. We, I think it's time to distill it and to simplify it and to reduce the number. So I think what we have to remember here is this essential medicine list is targeted at countries uh, which are trying to improve survival from, let's say, 30% to 60%, and not the countries that uh, want to improve it from 90% to 95%. So rather than going to an all-encompassing list, which includes all the, the modern immune modu uh, immune therapy agents and everything under the sun, uh, so maybe it's time to simplify it simply because uh, expanding it further causes um, is not improving matters on the ground. So, uh, so how do we do that? So this is not a, not a simple way. So this is how how would we go on do that? So we I would like to propose that we have a, something called a very essential medicine list. Uh, some have calling it a um, humanitarian list or a crisis list. But I don't think this 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 distilled down version is needed only at a time of a disaster, man-made environment, or whatever. Uh, even for um, even during normal times, uh, there is a, um, I think, a case to be made for a shorter list. So maybe we should concentrate on the on just on the six WHO uh, index cancers. Uh, if you see the standard regime, probably we need only around sixteen medicines. It might differ according to the treatment regimes you all use. If we add bone tumors and the soft tissue sarcomas to that group, only it'll increase it by three more drugs. So and when you when you decide on uh, treatment regimes, probably we uh, we you use the drug availability in mind as well. Our in our case, Hodgkin lymphoma was most affected because of that procarbamazine single drug was not uh, available. But we know that um, uh, uh, from the German German uh, uh, group uh, that uh, 
carbamazine free uh, uh, treatment regimes give better uh, or equal outcomes. So if you when you when you think of national uh, treatment regimes, probably drug availability has to keep in mind. Also, if you are really pushed and if you want to further reduce it, maybe substituting that with the same families, doxorubicin in donor, uh, replacing donor in um, ALL, uh, and certainly peg aspergenase replaced by uh, uh, L aspergenase uh, um, in ALL. Uh, those are uh, things that which could be substituted. Uh, so uh, also what we need to do need to always consider is we need to consider not only cytotech toxic so all the focus all the study all the research published has concentrated on cytotoxics but we know that we need the supportive care medicines the antibiotics um, uh, for uh, as all as almost as uh, much as the cytotoxic so we need to consider all of them as a single package when we want to uh, talk about availability and also, we, uh, we can't forget the diagnostic component. We have to diagnose children before actually starting to treat them accurately. And uh, I know Dr. Kat Lam, uh, uh, Monica Metzger, and the team is, uh, is very close to finalizing an uh, essential diagnostic list uh, for the WHO. So all of that has to be thought of in one single package. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, yeah. So one more thing I just wanted to add. Uh, medicine availability cannot be uh, talked about without quality assurance component. Uh, quality of medicines is a is a is a is a, is a big problem over here uh, in Sri Lanka and many of the other LMICs. So uh, uh, having the necessary policies in place because all of us can't have uh, overnight. We can't have labs which can ensure drug quality of the medicines we get. But probably we need to figure out uh, ways in, in building in rules and regulations of, uh, uh, to say that when we are procuring medicines, it has to come from a WHO pre-qualified lab. Or maybe the WHO can have a central regional quality assurance where they can do spot checks. Uh, uh, so I mean, the St. Jude and the WHO with the SIOP is uh, are working hard to uh, do on these on the, the essential on the cancer medicine availability platform so those kind of platforms can help the uh, the availability quite a bit and uh, so that but to accept those medicines there has to be necessary policy framework on the ground so that is also something that i uh, uh, think that we have to talk about in the same way when we are discussing um, availability of medicines so I will stop right just there. I think I went two minutes over time, so I apologize uh, and I will stop there. And uh, if there is time, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, that was a wonderful talk, Sajiva, really insightful. And uh, you're doing a great work in ensuring that uh, the policy is changed in terms of how we access uh, medicine. Uh, we can take a couple of questions. Uh, I'd like to start off, is there a, gray market or, you know, uh, when the medicines are not available, a parallel market running through which you can get medicines at, and in desperate situations, do parents go to this market and, you know, uh, how does it work in Sri Lanka? You're muted, Sanjay. Sorry. So, I, yes, I think so. The situation here is same here as well. But I think this is something. So sometimes we rely when there is no medicine is not available at all in the public sector. Uh, we rely. Uh, I mean, we would think that something is better than nothing. But I think this is something that we really need to stamp out for mainly because of quality reasons. There is no absolute way of ensuring quality of these drugs. Often these are spurious products uh, they can be even sometimes harmful for patients uh, so and number two is there is widespread exploitation of financial exploitation of parents you know the cancer parents with uh, um, a child with cancer they are often desperate they would do anything they would uh, uh, so so, uh, so people take advantage of this and 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 often you would find that the same medicines uh, which were available uh, when there was no shortage, often increased maybe twice or thrice in price. 
So this is this is not something uh, uh, for, uh, that we should encourage or we should. Uh, we, I think it's something that we should do our utmost to stamp out. Absolutely, because people would find business opportunities and stock hosts and uh, policy makers should have to get cost for that as well. I think if you don't have any questions, I'll hand over to my amazing uh, co-chair, Caitlin, to take over. Thank okay. you so much, Sanjeeva. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. We're so glad that you came with us this morning. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Scott Howard. Um, so. Uh, Dr. Howard trained in internal medicine, pediatrics, and epidemiology, and then did his HEMOC fellowship at St. Jude. He has conducted essential research um, in translation and, and clinical research with a special focus on leukemia and lymphoma and um, uh, uh, ensuring supportive care translation in low and middle income settings. He has published and co-authored over 200 papers and currently serves as the Secretary General for SIOP as well as has founded a, a group called Resonance, which is a global health company focused on improving care and outcomes for patients in low and middle income countries. Dr. Howard, we are so appreciative that you are here with us today. Um, as soon as we started thinking about speakers, your name came to the top of the list. And so I know there's many people here that um, are, are thrilled to, to hear from you and have this kind of informal discussion like our last um, uh, conversations with our senior investigators. We've asked for Dr. Howard to kind of have a more informal kind of fireside chat type of discussion. And so covering things like what got you into medicine, you know, what um, what uh, drove you to working in, in LMIC settings and um, also want to leave it open for those in the audience to, to ask questions uh, for Dr. Howard. So we'll have about 15 minutes um, of discussion and maybe additional five minutes for questions. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you again. Well, I really, really appreciate the chance to be with you today. And um, I also appreciate the chance to follow Sanjeeva because I think the idea of a system, like how do we develop a system to uh, improve uh, access to medicines? And it's not just a project. So you can do a project, but does that really change everything? Not usually. So we have to have a system. And when you think of a system, um, I think that's really the story of my whole life. So I was um, born in Dallas, Texas. And I, uh, when I was one year old, we left there and ultimately grew up mostly in Alabama, which is a, a Southern state in the United States. And um, I have, uh, I'm one of 10 brothers and sisters. And the reason that I have 10 or nine brothers and sisters plus me is because my parents had, um, had two kids and then we lived in Alabama and, um, and my father uh, in, in his middle age became a Christian and he started reading the Bible and he would read the Bible. And unlike any person I ever met, he would just read it and then do what it said. <laughs> so it's really a special situation because most people I know read their holy book and then do whatever they were gonna do anyway, right? And all of us can understand how none of us really always lives up to our own expectations of ourselves. And he was reading and in one place in, uh, there's the one place in the Bible where it says, true religion is this, taking care of widows and orphans and people in distress. And so he you know, turned to my mom and said, well, what are we doing for the, the widows and the orphans? You know, widows in the US don't have a problem, but he said, what about the orphans? And so next thing you know, we had a, a, an adopted child and then another one and then another one. And so the, um, my parents adopted my eight younger brothers and sisters uh, just because of that one line in the Bible after he had decided to dedicate his life to serving God and not to making money and having a fun, which were his two main goals before that. And so it was so important uh, in my life. I was 10 years old when my first adopted younger brother arrived. And so, of course, you know, from 10 to till now, yeah, I've been seeing how this impacted uh, their lives. And so I ended up um, with a very similar system. And so I actually have a, three children that are all three adopted. They were all from the Memphis area because by then I was living in Memphis. And so this idea of a system his system was, hey, you read, you say you believe this, you read it, you do it. That's a system. And a system is always better than a goal. And that is not only the message of my life, that's the message of today. And um, of course, I have slides because part of my system is 
you have to persuade people and persuasion is visual. So if you can see it, you can believe it. It's also fun because another part of my system, the very last part of the system is to actively fight pride and selfishness. And so you're gonna think this is too crazy religion and pride and selfishness, but I'm going to show you why this is the essential bedrock for act for every working group in PSYOP. It's all based on this exact same idea, which is to follow a system and a system that has to be outward facing, loving to the other person, not grabbing for the for oneself and working together, not because we're going to gain some fame or glory or um, publications, but because together we're going to accomplish our shared mission. And so I, I appreciate the, your introduction, Caitlin. And it's always the same because I used to be very famous and I was, uh, you know, Secretary General of PSYOP and uh, CEO of Resonance and a professor at University of Tennessee and Chairman of the Board of World Child Cancer USA Branch and a consultant at the World Health Organization. And so you look at this and you see all these logos and you think, wow, that guy must be important. And the danger of that is it's fine if you think I'm important. What's bad is when I think I'm important and then the toxicity starts and it's an internal rot. And I think we've all met the senior professor who all they care about is their own track record and their own accomplishments. And it poisons, uh, so many things it poisons, but mostly it poisons the next generation because they see that model and most of us do what we see. I saw what my father did. My father said many things. I saw him adopt eight brothers and sisters and raise them all as his own children. And so when you see that, it changes you. So now look, uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm on the way down. Went from five logos, just two left. And who knows, you know, when, what might happen to one of these. So if I didn't have a system, this last part, look at this, actively fight, uh-oh actively fight pride and selfishness. Well, isn't it useful when you had roles that you then don't have anymore? Because you can think, wow, I used to be famous, but I'm not anymore. Or I used to you know, have these three extra ways of being important that are no longer available. And so maybe that is not so bad. In fact, maybe it's very healthy. And you may not know the history of the um, global health, SIAP global health, when it was um, used to be called PSYOP PODC, Pediatric Oncology in Developing Countries. And there was um, the, before um, my chairmanship, which was the, the first chairmanship after Hans-Peter Wagner, who, was, um, who died last year, he was the chair for 20 years of the um, PSYOP PODC. And it's not because he just always wanted to be the leader, it's just nobody else was stepping up and it wasn't really popular to, um, be working on global pediatric oncology. And we would have our meeting and it would be a small room with 20 people, very friendly, wonderful people, but 20 people, you know, so now you see that even one meeting of one working group, we have more than we had in the whole thing um, in 2010. So the first change um, under my chairmanship with Trine Israels was to say, every leader rotates every three years and this rotation is mandatory. And why is that? because these should be roles, roles that we play, not things that we are. I am not the Secretary General of SIOP. I was the Secretary General of SIOP and I did that role for three years and now I no longer do that role. I currently happen to be a professor at the University of Tennessee, happen to be the CEO of Resonance, but that doesn't mean I'll always be those things. These are roles that I'm playing. They're not in the fundamental part of my character, which has to be something different than work. So systems are so better than goals. And I know you're thinking he's going to go for four hours, but we're almost done, actually. The rest is just the examples. And this is one of my favorite books. So you got to get this book, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. It's kind of the story of my life. And the reason I say it's kind of the story of my life was to do primary care and go maybe work in the jungles of Africa. And so I thought this was a beautiful plan and I did internal medicine and pediatrics and I studied French in case I ended up in a French speaking part of Africa or and studied Spanish in case I ended up in some jungle in South America instead, gonna be ready for anything. 
And then um, the surprise came where I ended up as a uh, academic pediatric oncologist at a tertiary care hospital, the richest, um, most well configured hospital in the world actually at St. Jude and worked there for many years, never got within a thousand kilometers of a jungle of Africa or a jungle of South America. So you think, whoa, that is one big failure. Your whole plan, the whole reason you went into medicine, you didn't do it. So you think, uh oh, big failure, didn't make it even within a thousand kilometers. But the system, the system was help everybody every day as much as possible. And it turns out I have been following that system. I've just been following it at St. Jude. And then when I left St. Jude in 2014, I went to join an informatics company. And the system again was help as many people as you can every day in every way you can. And one way I was helping a lot at St. Jude was with informatics. And so uh, when the informatics uh, couldn't grow at the rate that it needed to grow, then I went to join Remedy Informatics, which is an IT company. And they had 60 technical people. When I was at St. Jude, I had one and a half to build Pond for Kids and Cure for Kids. So it was always resource constrained and slow. And my signing bonus to go be the chief medical officer over there at Remedy Informatics was that all the software that that company would ever produce would be free forever for all people in low and middle income countries. And with 60 people working on it, their software was already very beautiful and it was getting more beautiful every day. So that seemed like a good idea and a way that I could help a lot of people every day, all the time, by helping to develop these, um, these tools that people could use. So again, going to work for a private for-profit startup IT company seems crazy, like a total failure from an academic uh, career. And, and yet it's actually a success because I'm following the system, which is help as many people as you can. And I don't have to worry about my own career. Why do I care about my own career? If I have a career, if I die today, I wanna die knowing that I helped as many people as I could, starting with my own children and uh, all the way to wherever people are that I could help. So the system requires one second piece, which is to align with your own core values. And one way to think about that is to think about why am I doing what I'm doing? Why did I wake up today and uh, you know, go to the neuroblastoma network meeting? And why did I write a, a paper you know, last week? What's the point of all that? And so when you think, why should we do what we do? I think it's easy. Because the why doesn't ever change, right? The why is the same as part of the system. So we don't have to think, oh, why should I write a paper today? Uh, do I need it for my career? Do I need it um, you know, so that people will respect me more or think I'm important? Do I need it uh, so that people will believe what I'm saying and act on it? Um, and the answer is no, the why is always the same. Save lives or improve lives, always the same. And when that's always the same and you align these daily activities with your own core values, it's like having a nuclear power plant right inside and that nuclear energy going day and night, it never stops. And we've been thinking a lot about energy lately with the shortage of gas and oil and you know, like in Sri Lanka, you know, one of the biggest problems is lack of fuel, which means lack of electricity. Without energy, what can you do? And in fact, they asked Bill and Melinda Gates if they could have one wish, what would they wish for? And Bill said, I wish I had more time. And Melinda said, I wish I had more energy. And so I was just thinking about this. This was in their newsletter about time and energy. And I think, what do we, what we all want more time and we all need more energy, but the energy is available to us because the energy is from alignment with our own core values. That's like the best energy ever. And it means when somebody, you know, does something stupid or says something mean or something doesn't work out, the energy is enough to keep moving, to use the time we have on this planet in the best way possible, burning the energy that's inside from that nuclear power plant. And so here's a, a study just comparing the um, causes of treatment failure for children with cancer. And this is about the why. Why work in PSYOP Global Health Network? It's because 80% of children in high income countries are cured, dark blue, this is much lower in low and middle income countries. And you could make a different histogram for each country, for each disease, even for each center. And so relapse, toxic death, abandonment, misdiagnosis, no diagnosis, all of these issues that are not relapse are very, very important in low and middle income countries, but almost impossible to even think about in high income countries because it's so small here. You can't even 
do research on this to find out how to get rid of these tiny 1%, 2% problems. So what would you do if you wanted to think about the why? I would think, well, why do these things happen and what can we do about it, right? Which leads to the third point, which is how to integrate continuous quality improvement into daily practice. So in other words, there's research and there's care. And as we treat each patient, we learn things that help all patients. So research is generalizable, care is individual. And generalized information is applied to the individual, and then individual learning goes back and can be generalized to learn more. And there's Gregory when he was, um, I don't know, I think 10 months, he was a very curious child. And it turns out quality improvement begins with curiosity. He's now um, actually 190, 1.9 meters tall and uh, 22 years old and works at FedEx. And so you never know what's gonna happen, you know, the curiosity, like what is this thing attached to my foot? So this I want you to really think about is how we learn and 70% of what we discuss. So I would like to now open up uh, this discussion for your questions and comments. Oop. And I see in the chat. Uh, no, great. Sanjeeva, you had a lot to talk about in the chat. Any comments? Yeah, thank or... you so much. Hmm. Oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to do the same thing you're about to do. So listen. <laughs> I just wanted <clears throat> I wanted to say thank you because I think um I think sometimes when we come to conversations like this, we want to show the accomplishments that we've made and we want to um, talk about um, kind of what we're working on. And I think um, as young investigators, we also need kind of a focus on wellness and that wellness doesn't necessarily mean, you know, talking about, well, sleep is important and, um, you know, mental health is important. I think also kind of taking a step back and thinking about realigning everything that we're working on with the goals of what, what we're really looking to achieve and recognizing that we all kind of have that common thread of, you know, we're working we're all working towards the same goal. Like we want to save lives. That's what we're, why we're in this together. Um, and so I think it, it kind of serves two purposes, bringing that up today, just kind of showing and reiterating that alignment kind of between everybody. And then I think it's always helpful to be able to take a step back and make sure that what you're doing um, is all pointing to that one, that one thing. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Caitlin, because I've been thinking a lot about the St. Jude Fellowship Program. And you know, there's always interventions to try to improve conditions for people in training, which is great and extremely important. But I think the only way to um, think about if you have that energy of alignment, you don't need the sleep, you don't need the mental health. It's It comes to you for free because the energy keeps burning. And so I feel like um, putting band-aids around our um, self-care is totally the opposite strategy of saying, what if you didn't have to care about yourself? What if you could be free of that? What if we could just enjoy doing our mission? Then suddenly we might find that our mental health was accidentally improved and that um, our, you know, everything was perhaps could be accidentally improved. So I, I think, um, I think it's interesting to think about, uh, you know, what can make things better. And for me, getting rid of all of these colors that aren't blue, boy, that's mm -hmm. worth staying up for. That's worth sacrificing yeah. my physical health, my mental health, every kind of thing. Um, but it turns out probably the, it comes back around and you end up with more mental health than you had before, maybe. Yeah, yes, absolutely. If that like cup is full, then you, you ultimately are feeling so much more fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And what also makes me happy is to think about um, in the past 12 years, what the SIAP Global Health Network has been doing, including your committee, and if you look at uh, all the causes of treatment failure, like no diagnosis, there's a bunch of contributing causes and a bunch of strategies, proven strategies, published strategies, things that definitely work in many different places. Why? Because people did the research like misdiagnosis. There's causes of misdiagnosis and there's strategies to address each cause of misdiagnosis and abandonment and toxic death and relapse. You know, you name the problem, there's a bunch of sub causes and a bunch of proven strategies, but we just got to apply these everywhere all the time. And 
I know what you might be thinking is, um, you might be thinking, why do I show the slide? But I just love this guy that I met in the Boston airport, uh, maybe 10 years. How many beers it took to build this abdomen? And I asked him how many, and he said, no, the, the trouble with my experiment is by the time you finish doing it, you, you don't remember. <laughs> he didn't have a database logging the number of beers and the amount of abdomen so that he could figure it out. And so of course we want something like a database. So Remedy Informatics, after I arrived there, four months after I arrived, that whole company went bankrupt. So all those 60 uh, technical people, no job. And me also, no job. Like literally, if they said meeting Monday, emergency company meeting, 5 p.m. I showed up like five minutes late and the boss who recruited me was saying, well, I hope to work with some of you in a future company. You know, And they said, you stop work immediately, send in your computer back to headquarters and that's it, we're done. And so then I was just meditating on what to do because talk about a failure, leaving St. Jude, the dream job, going to a job that had some great opportunity to scale up the effort and then poof, it all disappeared. And so that's why I started Resonance actually, not because I really wanted to run a company. It's, it's, um, it takes a lot of energy to run a company, but because I wanted to be able to create the patient center that would not disappear for legal reasons, would not disappear for financial reasons. And so that, that's what motivated that. And again, it's just following the same old system. How many people can you help each day? And how can you help more tomorrow, even than today? And that's why research and informatics are so useful because they're highly scalable. So all of this stuff, you know, it's very hard to generate these histograms. Well, in the patient center, you just push a button. So the hard part is then the data entry. And if you want to know before and after in Vietnam or before and after in Mali or before and after in Paraguay, this took took me hundreds of hours to create this. Um, now with patient center, this is just click, generate the graph and, and you're done. And so I think your system, our system should be to focus on one or two issues that help that we can feasibly influence and that help a lot of people. So we can't do 35 projects. Um, you, I hope you, I'll help you're hearing this, Trisha. So pick one or two, or maybe you have lots of energy, pick three or maybe four, but not 20, not 30, never 50. And work on those and pick the ones that you know you can do. Because if I wanted to work on surgical outcomes, I probably can't do that. So I should probably pick something else. And I, I picked abandonment early on because it was a problem that wasn't getting too much attention 20 years ago. And now it's had a lot of attention, but um, these were some of the things that early on were identified as, as problems. Health beliefs turned out to be totally wrong, at least in Brazil. And what was interesting is this guy, Francisco Pedrosa, he said, uh, they studied abandonment and asked people, why did you leave? And what everybody said was, oh, I'm just trusting God to heal my child. And they put in the database, left for religious reasons. But it turns out uh, when, um, when he provided this free guest house and free transportation and free food, then the abandonment rate went down from 16% to 1% to 0.5%. And now it's actually 0.0% in, in the, you know, the past 10 years. And why did it go down? It's not that people quit believing in God. It's just that people had a bus ticket, they had a place to stay, and they had food. And so, of course, what do you do if your child has cancer and you don't have food or a bus ticket? What do you say? Do you say, oh, doctor, I abandoned treatment because I cannot afford to get my child the treatment? No, you say, well, I'm trusting God. I hope something good happens, but I can't do, I can't do it. So the whole way we even think about how to collect the information is, is biased. And, and Pedrosa said, I always thought uh, people would tell him, oh, these 16%, they abandoned because they have eight kids. What do they care if one dies of cancer? They still have seven. And he said, I never knew how to answer these stupid people, but now I can answer them with this graph <laughs> to the stupid people to say, surprise, even with eight kids, they love the eighth one and they'll get the treatment for the eighth one if they have a chance, if they have that bus ticket and the food and the place to stay. So here's the database. This one is in Tagalog. So it's super handy because you just click a button here and put your data in, in whatever language you want and take it out in whatever language you want. So this system is free forever for everyone, everywhere. It's super handy for preventing abandonment because patient tracking in El Salvador, patient tracking reduced abandonment from 12% to 2%. But of course, don't read some tiny number. Part of my system is show it with a picture. 12% down to 2%. So there's even a system for giving a presentation. 
surprise, it has to be personal and it has to be visual. So those are, that's it. That's the whole system, personal and visual. Oh, and a single message that just keeps coming back over and over. Systems are better than goals. If you finish today and you don't know that systems are better than goals, then that's a total failure. And um, my wife, Catherine Lamb, is here pictured. She also was studying abandonment. In fact, that's um, doing projects together, like first of all, defining what is abandonment, because people used all of these terms. And my favorite one is run away. <laughs> that's in the Philippines. The, the, they had in the database, the patient ran away. And I just pictured the nurse running after them with chemotherapy bag saying, no, get some treatment. And they ran away. But um, all of these things are not necessarily the same as abandonment. So what Kath did was to divide it up into incomplete treatment, premature discharge from the hospital, loss of data, foregoing curative therapy, profile of inconsistency like non-compliance, non-adherence, or treatment irregularity, and then abandonment, which is different from all these things. And she also made it uh, very easy to follow which was which. And then finally, a nice flowchart so that you could, you know, yes, no, no, yes, you end up with whatever you end up with. So these colors here, notice also the system is to keep the same colors, foregone curative treatment, green, foregone curative treatment, green. And then here's some examples of foregone curative treatment versus abandonment itself. So defining the problem is also part of it. And the next thing you know, we got married after that. that. That wasn't part of the system, but that was just a happy byproduct of the system. Finally, involve everyone in published results. We learn 100% of what we write. And uh, Dr. Pui, Ching Hong Pui at St. Jude was one of my first mentors at St. Jude. And um, I asked him about a paper. I said, hey, did you read this paper? And he said, I don't read papers, I write papers. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean you don't read papers? Because I've seen him discuss papers. And he said, no, I write papers and whatever I need to read to write that paper, that's what I read. So if he's writing a paper about thrombosis in children with leukemia, he'll read every paper about leukemia and thrombosis. So he's reading on the way to producing generalizable knowledge. And you remember 100% of what you write. So therefore writing is critical. And I wanted to show you one example here of um, May and, um, and uh, uh, here they are, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, Saskia and May, the first and second author, they did their PhD together and they wrote seven papers together about um, childhood cancer in Indonesia and issues there. And so the success factor is key individuals, but the other success factor was working together. Isn't it great when you can have a partner helping you out? And it's so frustrating. I've written hundreds of emails, um, in fact, many of them from the same people in some cases that say, I don't have mercaptopurine in my country, what do I do? And I wrote down this beautiful email about what to do and nobody ever followed it. When we published this paper based on the exact same strategy, now people do it. So apparently if it's a PDF, people believe it. If it's an email that says the exact same thing without the PDF, people don't believe it. So you have to write, it gives credibility, even though it shouldn't. It does. And that's part of persuading people is making something credible. And I will finish with one last failure. This book, uh, the only book I've ever written, and you can see what a beautiful title, Renal Disease and Cancer Patients. And, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to buy this book? Well, apparently you wouldn't either, and nobody else would. And um, nobody reviewed the book. Nobody bought the book. It sold three copies in the first year. And so my system if my system were to, uh, I have a new system, which is never write another book. And that's a system I will always follow. But um, what if my system had been write a book and get famous and rich? Then I would be a total failure. But my system was try to help as many people as you can every day. And what did I learn from writing this book? I learned that writing books is not an effective way to help people, at least not my books. Dr. Pui's book is helping people very, very effectively. So we finish with the same place we started, actively fight pride and selfishness. These are the worst drains of energy and they drain energy from an individual and they can drain energy from an entire system, from an entire planet. You can drain the energy by pride and selfishness. So I think um, there's Gregory and his a uh, little bit older and his favorite dog that he copied. Um, so hungry to share information that helps others, but mostly hungry to do everything that helps others. And what if somebody else is the first author or the last author of that paper? Well, maybe that's okay. Maybe the reason I wanted to be first was not so I could help more people, but so that I could be more famous. And so I, I uh, go back to Dr. Pui. When he offered me a job, he said, uh, come and work with me and I'll make you famous. 
And I said, uh, I'm not so interested in being famous. I mostly want to help people. And he paused for a minute. He looked at me and he said, you'll help more people if you're famous. So I thought, okay, he's, he's too smart, right? Uh, but maybe fame as a means to an end takes out the toxicity from it. If you say, I will acquire fame, I will acquire an informatics organization that I'll be the CEO of it. If that's necessary to help more people in a better way, then of course, we've got to do it. But it's a means to an end. The end is save the lives of children with cancer. Save the lives of children with cancer. That's what matters to us, right? In pediatric oncology professionals. So filling up the intro slide, not a good idea or not helpful, or maybe helpful. Uh, you know, working at World Health Organization did provide some extremely useful tools to save more lives. So this was really a great phase. And this also is a great phase to focus in on the way residents can save and improve lives and the way the University of Tennessee can help save and improve lives. And so that's what I'm talking about. Systems are better than goals and the system aligning with our own values, continuously doing research and care every day, all the time in every issue and focusing on one or two things where we can really move the field forward, involving everyone, publishing results, and actively fighting pride and selfishness. These are the systems that will really move us all forward. And this is the founding principle of the SIAP Global Health Network. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I am gonna use I'm going to use this these last couple of minutes to go over some um, information for the working group. So I just wanted to remind everybody that as of today, there are 48 days left before the SIOP conference. And just also a quick reminder that you can um, have reduced registration costs if you sign up before September 6th. And we hope to see you all between the 28th and October 1st. Um, for those that haven't, please check out the website because in addition to kind of conference information, they also have information about Barcelona itself. Um, you can take a sneak peek at some of the conference programs um, and please note that there is educational day on Wednesday, September 28th. And so there'll be lots of events that are specifically targeted for young investigators um, as well as those in global health. If you haven't, um, I recommend you start following the Young SIOP group on Twitter. Um, they also have this Young SIOP Network Expert Lunch that's on the 28th from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Um, that's gonna be at the convention center where the conference is. And please note that you're, uh, this is free with your purchase of Congress registration. So all you have to do is go, go on and register. If you follow them on Twitter, they have the link there in one of their recent posts. Um, and then I wanted to kind of refocus our group. So when we've done different discussions and different surveys about what is important to everybody here, I think they really boil down to three things, networking and mentorship, educational content and career development, and then research collaboration and skill building. And we've done a lot of, I think, um, career development and then also kind of mentorship uh, through the discussions that we've had today. In terms of continuing that, we have the WhatsApp group I'm really excited to say we are up to 132 members as of today. Um, you can, uh, in this group, you'll see information about our upcoming meetings. People will post um, open applications for things like leadership development courses or grants that are open, as well as recent publications from uh, fellow YI and updates on our working group meetings. If you know somebody's interested, please message myself or Venkat and we can get you added to the group. Um, we also are working to put together a Twitter uh, specifically for the SIAP young, um, young LMIC group. And part of that, we really want to highlight the work of you all that are part of us. And so um, we also will connect with um, the young SIAP group so that we can uh, share activities between the two. Um, as part of that, either in WhatsApp or via email or type it in the chat, before the conference, if you are presenting a poster or you have an oral presentation, please let us know. Send us your name, where you're from, what your poster title is and poster number. Um, and if you're at the conference, send us a picture of you with your work so that we can have that highlighted on our Twitter page. Um, also, Venkat and I have been talking. We'd love to get a chance to meet people in person. Um, we actually had the opportunity to meet in person for the first time just a couple weeks ago at St. Jude. And so we really want to look forward to um, meeting everybody here. So we'll include some information about that on our WhatsApp group, or if you have any ideas and want to meet up with people, um, please 
please uh, reach out to us via that group. Um, in terms of questions, comments, suggestions, we always want to hear feedback from everybody. And so let us know um, if there's somebody that you would like to hear from. Um, we had initially said our, our next meeting was going to be October 11th. I think we'll actually push it back just a little bit to get everybody um, some time to get settled back from the conference. Just like the one today, you'll have to pre-register to get the Zoom link. Um, and if you have any questions or any suggestions for us, again, please feel free to reach out to us via email um, or via the WhatsApp group. So with that, um, I just want to thank everybody again for being here. Thank you, Sanjeeva. Thank you, Scott, for your wonderful presentations. Um, we're so, so pleased that you could join us today, and we look forward to seeing everybody at the conference. Thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to like to share with the group? Well, thanks, Caitlin, and thanks, Sanjeeva and Scott, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, when we started off, I remember the first meeting was quite nervous. Uh, now, now it looks like you know it's, uh, we are settled, and it's exciting to see the various topics and divergent topics you are covering, and so much participation uh, from the young LMIC. And it's a big platform, and I would say that it's just not limited to young LMIC. It's for everybody in the world who wants to uh, contribute towards LMIC and. Uh, as Scott says, uh, save every child. So uh, thank you, Caitlin. And uh, we can close. Uh, we are on time. Wonderful. I will stay on for just a couple minutes if there's anybody that has any questions. But otherwise, thank you, everybody. Sure, uh, yeah. And we'll see you at the conference. Take care, everybody. Great to be with you. Have a good day. Thanks, Scott. All right, thank God. I'll see you later. Have a great rest of your evening. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. See you. Bye. Bye.